Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome to Adventures in History. Today's topic is Franklin Pierce, Part 3, 14th U.S. President, Triumph and Tragedy. We stopped last time in 1852, and uh, Franklin Pierce had been nominated by the Democratic Party as uh, their presidential candidate in the presidential election. He was a dark horse candidate, although, you know, he'd been in, 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 in Congress and in the House of Representatives and in, uh, in the Senate. He was, had a lot of friends. And remember, back then, uh, the voters did not have any, any say in choosing the nominee. It was decided by party insiders. And, of course, he knew a lot of people. And, and, uh, but he was, he was not the first choice. He was, the, uh, he was a, uh, a, a dark horse. But, but nevertheless, he was, of course, nationally famous as the... Uh, as the one of one of two men who would become elected president in 1852, and when uh, that he was out of town when that happened, the news came, and and then he returned to his home in Concord, New Hampshire, the capital of the state, and uh, Roy Franklin Nichols described what happened. Quote: The whole town thronged to extend their congratulations. The Concord brass band serenaded him. That was at his home. Now, at that time, you and for a long time afterward, uh, presidential candidates did not campaign. So they would, they, you could argue that in 1852, all roads uh, led to Concord, New Hampshire. Of course, we're not sure where Win, Winfield Scott's home was. As, uh, but the, there was campaigning, uh, you know, by, by the party for the candidate. And there were granite clubs organized uh, that were for campaigning for Franklin Pierce. He got the nickname during this time of Young Hickory of the Granite Hills. At, apparently the Granite Hills are in New Hampshire and then um, and Young Hick Hickory as opposed to Old Hickory who was the a dominant person in the uh, Democratic Party at that point, although he had uh, Andrew Jackson had passed away. For, uh, now uh, Franklin Pierce's friend Nathaniel Hawthorne, the famous author of The Scarlet Letter and House of Seven Gables among other uh, books, uh, was uh, requested, was contacted to write a biography to help the public know Franklin Pierce better, which he did. Because uh, all of a sudden there's great curiosity about whoever these men are, the nominees. And Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote, quote, Franklin Pierce's portrait is everywhere, and in all the shop windows, and in all sorts of styles, on wood, steel, and copper, on horseback, on foot, in uniform, in citizen's dress, in iron medallions, in little brass medals, and on handkerchiefs. So, of course, it's a big deal, the presidential election, all types of uh, 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 promotions and uh, souvenirs for each candidate. Now, 1852, slavery was a growing, it was continuing to be a more nationally divisive issue. And, uh, you know, during the uh, during the campaign, uh, when the candidates are fixed, there's a lot of criticism and and, of course, uh, Franklin Pierce did have a reputation for drinking, and he was also a—the temperance movement was uh, a popular thing at the time. The movement to, to make alcohol illegal, of course, he was involved, so that was brought up, the question of his drinking. Now, in the election, uh, uh, Franklin Pierce won big. He won in a landslide. He was from the North, so that gave him support in the North, obviously. And then in the South, he was sympathetic to slavery. He was not an ab he was not an abolitionist, and he was also open to the extension of slavery into the territories. So he won in a landslide. Now, his uh, Winfield Scott, his candidate, his uh, opponent, the Whig Party candidate, uh, really was not very charismatic. Was you know rather pompous, and actually the Whig Party was dying at that time, and so that was one of the one factor, um, and now, so, now the thing is, uh, yeah. So anyway, Franklin Pierce was elected president in, in 18. So here, just imagine. So this was a big deal. Um, Roy Franklin Nichols wrote, "Quote: Franklin Pierce could hardly sense it, but he was to reign in the chair of Andrew Jackson." So this really came out of the blue. He really wasn't expecting to be nominated, and then all of a sudden, he's the, uh, he's the. Uh, um, He's won, and he's going to be inaugurated in, in the March of 1853. Now, he was very interested in preserving. He, Frank Pierce was dedicated to the Democratic Party. Now, the country was, was falling, 
was was falling apart was being divided into two because of slavery, and that was also happening to the Democratic Party. And so it was, it was, this was a very tragic time and really an impossible time to be president, becoming harder, trying to keep the country together. Okay, so moving into 1853 in January, uh, Franklin Frank and Jane, his wife, and their son, ben, Benny, Benjamin, or Ben, they were on a train trip traveling from Boston, Massachusetts, to Concord, New Hampshire, in New England. And there, there, was, a, there was a very tragic accident. The train derailed and tumbled down a 20-foot culvert, a depression, and Frank, Frank and Jane were badly bruised, but they survived. Their son, Ben, or Benny, age 11, had the back of his head sheared off, and he died instantly. So this is uh, incredible, incredibly uh, tragic. Um, so their third son now had died, and um, just imagine he just he just won the presidency, and you know this was a happy time, and all of they lost their son. Uh, Frank and Jane were grief ridden, and they, they also were you know they'd been hurt in this accident. Ray Ray Frank R- Roy Franklin Nichols wrote quote. On the day set, Franklin, Jane, and Benjamin Pierce boarded the morning train, but they had proceeded scarcely a mile when there was a sudden snap and and jar, then a violent shock as the car in which they were seated toppled off the embankment and rolled into the field below. Mr. and Mrs. Pierce were practically uninjured, but Benny had been caught in the wreckage and horribly killed before their eyes. Roy Franklin Nichols continued, quote, the next few days were filled with slow-passing hours of stupefying grief, paralysis of thought, and dazed half-living. Franklin Pierce's great justification for assuming the burden of the presidency had been the thought of building a heritage which might aid his son Benny's advance in life. Now this great station was no longer a half-compensated resp- responsibility, but an impending horror. Now, obviously, Jane was, you know, Jane had, had suffered depression, had two uh, sons already died. She was very close to their son, Benny, and, and this was, you know, she was distraught, and uh, this was unbelievable tragedy. Ray Franklin Nichols wrote, quote, God said Jane had taken their boy so that Pierce might have no distraction caused by his preoccupation in the ch- in the child's welfare, to interfere with his attention to the great responsibilities which were to be his. The death of his son, Benny, became the fact, became the fact of greatest importance in Franklin Pierce's life, troubling his conscience, unsettling him almost completely, and weakening his self-confidence for many months to come. At a time when he required peace and self-control for summoning all his powers to the big tasks awaiting him, he was distracted and worn by heart searchings. Roy Franklin Nichols continued, quote, President Pierce was to work under a permanent handicap. His was not a frame of mind to command success or to invite inspiration. Much of the difficulty which he experienced in administration during the next four years may be attributed to this terrible tragedy and its long-continued after-effects. Yeah, this is an unbelievable thing that happened because, you know, not only he had, now he, all three of their sons had died, one, the first uh, shortly after birth, the second at age four, and now this third at age 11, and he was in he was in an impossible situation as president because the no, but the country was headed towards civil war. So all the you know the biographers that like to say, oh, Franklin Pierce was a failure. He was a weak president. I think you know I think they're absolutely wrong. I totally disagree. They, there's no sense of understanding what this poor man was going through, uh, the impossibility of his situation as president in a country that was growing more and more divided. And then you add on this unbelievable tragedy that he dealt with, and you you have to give him a lot of credit for making the best, doing his best under impossible. Uh, just uh, uh, or, yeah. it's hard to come up with words to describe this this pain that he was living in and this very very tough uh, situation he was in. Now, reportedly, Jane wrote letters to their son Benny, who had died, asking for his forgiveness. In the White House, Jane cast a permanent pall on the Franklin Pierce administration. Yeah, she was this very unhappy woman. You know, she'd been depressed, and obviously if you're depressed and have a tragedy like this, it's going to become worse. Roy Franklin Nichols wrote, quote, 
Life had to be faced again. Public responsibilities crowded upon the president-elect. Franklin, uh, Franklin Pierce wrote, quote, How I shall be able to summon my manhood and gather up my energies for the duties before me, it is hard for me to see. So he was in grief. It was This is January, and by March he had to be inaugurated. And, and life goes on, and he had to do his best. Roy Franklin Nichols wrote, quote, Franklin Pierce had proudly planned to have his son Benny with him on the inauguration day so that he could witness his father's triumph and remember it ever afterward. Now he must go through the ordeal alone and with a sense of guilt. So by March was the inauguration day, and then uh, he was inaugurated at the Capitol and then back uh, at the White House. Uh, uh, Now, Roy Franklin Nichols described uh, the reception and people coming to greet the new president, quote, All that afternoon, the muddy-footed throng pressed in to meet their new chief magistrate. So finally, the crowd left, and uh, and later in the early evening, and Roy Franklin Nichols wrote, quote, Mud, empty refreshment dishes, and silence now reigned in the executive mansion. Now, later at night, uh, Ray Franklin Nichols described, quote, The president and his private secretary were not long in deciding to retire, but where were they to sleep? The servants were not within call, and President Pierce had not yet a moment to look at his new quarters. After a little search, they found a candle and ascended the stairs. In the private apartments, all was confusion and nothing was ready. After a ghostly inspection of these deserted, disorderly rooms, so dreary in the feeble light of the flickering candle, Pierce pointed to one and said to his secretary, You had better turn in here, and I will find a bed across the hall. Franklin Pierce was alone at last, and in the White House. Finally, he was possessed of that will of the wisp of his ambition. Yes, he was President of the United States, but how little satisfaction that honor seemed to bring. If only Mrs. Pierce did not dread it so, if Benny were here to join in his father's honor. Now his vice presidential candidate, the new vice president was Rufus King, and he was sworn into office from a hospital bed in Havana, Cuba, where he was being treated for tuberculosis. And he died one month later into his term, and he eventually came home to Alabama and and then died. And then actually there was no replacement, so, so... for most of uh, Franklin Pierce's term, he did not have a vice. There was no vice president. I don't know why they, puzzling why they didn't uh, have a new uh, vice president to replace uh, Rufus King. So Franklin Pierce was inaugurated as the 14th U.S. president. March 4th, he was battling depression. Now, Jane did not come for the inauguration. She, she was still grieving at home in New Hampshire. And again, April, Rufus King died, the vice president. Now, in foreign, some of the issues uh, President Pierce was facing in pr- foreign relations, the top priorities were dealing with Mexico, Great Britain, and Spain. Uh, president Pierce sent James Gadsden to Mexico to purchase southern Arizona and southern New Mexico for $15 million. The area was needed for a rail, east-west railroad, and this became known as the Gadsden Purchase and which uh, meant the continental United States assumed its present shape. That was the final piece uh, to the the continental U.S. Now, in 1853, the White House, the southern border of the White House, there was a president's garden, which was described as, quote, an unkempt maze of stagnant ponds and pestilential sogginess, which merged, merged with the vile Potomac Flats. Here flourished the mosquitoes, which carried malaria or intermittent fever. An occasional breeze wafted an unpleasant stench when temperature and tide were not right. In early March, no place ever looked more forlorn or presented a more melancholy environment to a sad and lonely man. Uh, During his presidency, President Pierce battled malaria, and this was connected to to all these uh, hordes of mosquitoes which were in the vicinity there. Now, his cabinet included Jefferson Davis, who was an old friend, Secretary of War, and the future president of the Confederate States of America during the Civil War. Regarding Jefferson Davis, Roy Franklin Nichols described him, quote, His natural reserve, which passed for haughty indifference, was accentuated by ill health. 
for willpower alone enabled him to overcome the neuralgia which so frequently tortured him. Roy Franklin Nichols wrote, quote, Jane Pierce remained socially alone and among strangers, apparently after she arrived in Washington and the White House. She was without any outlet and simply surrendered to an all-enveloping melancholy, from which she attempted to find no relief. To nurse her grief, she very successfully secluded herself from all forms of public notice, sitting upstairs, writing little, little pitiful notes to her lost boy reproaching herself for not having tried harder to express to him her great love. Needless to say, the White House was anything but a social center. Yeah, Jane had difficulty ex- showing emotion, showing affection, and uh, so here now, here she's feeling, the First Lady, she's feeling this guilt for not showing her love for her son more. Of course, he's gone. Now, uh, as president, the, some of the issues in foreign relations uh, regarding uh, conflict with Great Britain, there was an issue over fishing waters of Nova, Nova Scotia and Newfoundland off the northeast coast, uh, fish, r- fishermen's rights. Uh, James Buchanan, uh, actually the successor to Fra- Frank Pierce, uh, was sent as ambassador to Great Britain to negotiate with them, and there was a trade treaty signed. The U.S. wanted Great Britain out of Central America. Eventually, they had the, the British had the uh, colony of, of uh, British Honduras, now known as v- v- Belize, and that was a violation of the clayton Bulwer Treaty. This was a strategic area, Central America, because everyone was expecting eventually a canal to be built. And in the meantime, people were traveling down there uh, and by boat and then crossing by, by land. Um, and across the isthmus and then taking another boat up to California, which apparently was quicker, at least before the railroads were put in. And there was a there was an expectation that the United States and Great Britain together would, would build a canal there. So they had agreed there'd be no colonies there. There are also issues with the on, well, ongoing Indian wars uh, and fighting American Indians as the U.S. expanded west. And uh, the, the, the U.S. Army was small, not that many fellows, and the, the frontier was vast, so, so that was not an easy thing to, to do, to fight Indians over a long, well, very large area. Uh, there was a survey uh, done for a possible railroads leading to the Pacific coast, and a survey party was also sent to locate, try to locate a route in Central America for a Panama Canal. Uh, Robert McClelland was the Secretary of Interior in the cabinet, and uh, he was involved with public lands and, and dealing with American Indians and the pension system. And reportedly, there was an immense opportunity for graft and corruption in these areas. Roy Franklin Nichols wrote, quote, The new secretary found the cleansing of the Augean stables a truly Herculean work. Nice reference to ancient Greece. Yeah, there was, apparently was a lot, a lot of corruption in the areas that uh, the Secretary of Interior Robert McClellan was uh, was dealing with. 1853 was the exhibition of the industry of all nations, starting from July 14th of 1853, going to all the way to November 1st of 1854 at Bryant Park Park in New York City, New York State. Roy Franklin Nichols wrote, "Quote." In New York City, the United States was to hold its first World's Fair at the newly erected Crystal Palace, to which Queen Victoria was sending as her personal representatives the Earl of Ellesmere and Sir Charles Lyell, the geologist. Ellesmere. Now, Earl Ellesmere, that must be where the the Canadian Arctic Ellesmere Island is named after. Now, in the Demo- 1853, we're still in the first year of uh, Frank, President Pierce's presidency, and the Democratic Party was disintegrating because of the slavery issue was becoming more divisive. And there was also a conflict uh, over patronage, which is all, always an issue. In other words, uh, government jobs. In the summer, the summer of 1853, Franklin, President Pierce received a delegation of Potawatomi Indians who were protesting the dishonesty of the uh, government agent who was dealing with them. There was a yellow fever epidemic in New Orleans, and uh, Frank, President Pierce uh, donated money to help complete the Washington Monument, or at least continue with its construction. It had, only, uh, it had attained a height of only 128 feet. The construction had started in 1848 and wouldn't be done until 1884. 
and eventually it would be 555 feet high. So it was just a short, it was just a stub. It, it, it took a long, yeah, it took uh, more than thir- 36 years to finish that huge obelisk honoring the first president and the father of the U.S., uh, George Washington. Summer of 1853, Frank, President Pierce enjoyed uh, cruising on the Potomac River in the, in the ship, the USS Engineer, and he was entertained. He and his guests were entertained by the Marine Band. Band. They sailed as far as Indian Head and enjoyed the placid beauties of the Potomac River and the inspiration of Mount Vernon, George Washington's home. President Pierce attempted to be impartial regarding patronage. And that's a, not one of the toughest things to deal with. Everyone's looking for an, a good government job, and there aren't enough jobs for all the people involved. And so he wanted to. Uh, and so there's obviously there's hard feelings um, uh, dealing with these different personalities and factions, and there this is always con- at least it used to be conflict, political conflict as a result. Roy Franklin Nichols wrote, "Quote: A number of Democratic senators and congressmen were coming to Washington to make war upon a president of their own party. The presumptuousness of this accidental president and his small potato cabinet, in their inflated pride and inexperience." attempting to impose a reorganization of their own invention upon the old and tried leaders of the party. Apparently, uh, Franklin Pierce was trying to uh, really uh, reward, you know, merit, uh, hire people based on merit rather than politics. And, of course, that did lead to problems within his own party. In his State of the Union address in 1853, President Pierce expressed unlimited confidence in the resourcefulness of the American people and the exceptional and and excellence of the institutions established by the Founding Fathers, and the importance of having fidelity to the principles in the Constitution, and a belief in the importance of of a minimum federal government, a deference to the sovereign rights and dignity of every state, and respect among the states, and the, the importance of integrity in public service. So those were some of the uh, principles he highlighted. Now, in the White House, there was moving into, now we're moving into 1854. The East Room that year got a new carpet, bright red, which weighed a ton. Just imagine a ton of carpet, that's a big carpet. Now, uh, there was, of course, visitors coming, coming, would come to see him, individuals and groups. And to one group of visitors, President Pierce said, quote, You need no introduction to this house. It is your house, and I am but the tenant for a time. Now, President Pierce enjoyed horseback riding as in, in Washington City. He enjoyed the company of Southern congressmen who were more friendly and had, more, more, had warmth and cordiality versus the stiff and staid New Englanders of his home st- state of New Hampshire. Now, during this time, 1854, of course, settlers continued to move west they're moving into the unorganized territory. Uh, now, railroad interests were important. These were the, actually the biggest companies at the time, or along with textile mills. And there was a belief that the territory, the Northwest Territory, uh, would soon be open to settlement. Well, settlers were still moving in regardless, but it, but it hadn't been organized. Kansas and Nebraska were being uh, prepared for statehood. Uh, now, that, now, that's those two what states today are... Uh, on the border of Missouri, which is a slave state. And this, now the slaveholders in Missouri were worried that if there was a free territory on their border, namely Kansas, that it would become a refuge for escaped slaves. Uh, slavery was prohibited north of the 36-degree th- north latitude in the Compromise of 1820. And there was southern desire to repeal that compromise. Of course, actually, uh, Missouri is north, and that was, but you're, they weren't. That was supposed to be it. And beyond uh, moving west, they weren't supposed to have uh, slave states north of 36 degrees latitude. But that would have. Uh, but if if they followed that, that would have meant Kansas was a would have to be a free state. And again, they this was uh, uh, not this was disliked by the slave interest in in Missouri, who believed that oh well, the slaves would be able to escape into Kansas. Now, the 1854 was the, uh, the Kansas-Nebraska Act was passed with the support of President Pierce. And the bottom line is that under this uh, law, the, the, 
that slavery could exist in Kansas if the settlers wanted it. And this was a viol- this was a, basically a violation of the Compromise of 1820, meaning there was the possibility of slavery could be nor- uh, north of 36 degrees. And actually, this uh, led to civil war in Kansas. And there was uh, President Pierce received a great deal of criticism for this. But uh, the thing is, it was he was... This was what was, as they say, politics is the art of the possible. And President, this is how they needed to have uh, legislation so that Kansas and Nebraska would become states organized so that the railroads could be built. There could be surveys done so the railroads could be built uh, going toward the Pacific Ocean. Anyway, so this was passed where basically it said, well, the people of Kansas, they can decide whether or not slavery, they could have slavery in their state. And this actually led to, as I said, civil war in Kansas, and uh, which was actually a pr- prelude to the Civil War. In 1854, President Pierce said, quote, Nothing can be more apparent than that an overruling power is and has been controlling in the form and destinies of men and nations, nor can anyone anything be more idle than to foresee or grasp the consequences. All we can do is act with a wise and comprehensive view of what may be seen, and ought with exercise of judgment and vigilance to be anticipated. So this is an interesting quote. He's saying, you know, you, you do your best, but he could tell that, there, you know, God does have his plans for, for every country and for the world. And, and, and just do your best to try to uh, do, do the right thing. Now, there was an incident at the Capitol. Frank President Pierce came to the Congress to, 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 to speak or to, to meet with congressmen. And as he was leaving, there was a drunk young man who invited President Pierce to have a drink with him as President Pierce was leaving. Now, President Pierce was trying, he was on the wagon, he wasn't drinking, he said no, he did, of course, he didn't even know this fellow. And then Roy Franklin Nichols described, quote, the youth began to enumerate the various great men with whom he had imbibed. Okay, so you, <laughs> this was a funny, interesting, now, funny incident. Now, President Pierce's carriage arrived, and then they were getting ready to leave, and the young man threw a hard-boiled egg at him, apparently hit him. And President Pierce didn't appreciate that, had the young man arrested, but later he changed his mind, withdrew the complaint. So that was an interesting, better hard boil. at least it wasn't a soft-boiled egg, where the egg would have um, soiled his, his clothing. There was discussion in 1854 about the idea of purchasing Cuba uh, from, from Spain. Spain was in debt. And, of course, Cuba is very just off the coast of Florida, and there was, Americans had long been interested in Spain. There was uh, interest in having it be a slave state. Uh, now that, and, that, of course, that meant northern opposition to acquiring Cuba. Uh, now, that, now, Spain was in debt to the Rothschild family, who was among uh, well, the, 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 the powerful family in the banking industry. And the Rothschilds wanted Spain to reportedly wanted Spain to sell uh, Cuba so they get their money back, but of course it, it never did, it never happened. Roy Franklin Nichols wrote, quote, Franklin Pierce never learned to be suspicious of other people, and near the end of his life remarked that he always trusted a, ma- a man until he found him wanting. The uh, Fugitive Slave Act had been passed, and uh, President Pierce enforced this, and this led to him being unpopular in his native New England. Uh, William L. Marcy was Secretary of State, and uh, he had this to say, quote, The prevailing humor of the people is to find fault and be dissatisfied. While this humor prevails, doing well does not much avail. He was referring to the uh, criticism of the P- President Pierce administration during as the country was more and more divided. Now, uh, tragically, in Kans- Kansas, which was on the road to becoming a state, uh, was uh, had for a while had two capitals, a pro-slavery uh, capital at Lecompton, Kansas, and anti-slavery at Topeka. And actually, people were moving in. There were there were slave people in favor of slavery moving in from Missouri, and then abolitionists, anti folks against slavery moving in from New England. And then, and there was conflict between these two groups, and actual fighting, violence, and people act destruction of property, and actually people getting killed. 
Uh, President Pierce, uh, as I said, supported the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and this became unpopular because it meant the expansion of slavery into the North, and uh, he was... This is the thing that he, people criticized him for. Now, during this time as well, we said earlier that the Whig Party was, uh, was on its way, it was, was dying, and a new party was emerging, the Republican Party, which was uh, against uh, the expansion of slavery into the, into, the, into the territory. Now, so as this process continued in Kansas, Kansas was being surveyed. The settlers were coming in, again, from two different groups, pro-slavery and anti-slavery, which led to, they called it bleeding Kansas. Well, that concludes today's, today's presentation. We'll, we'll wrap up uh, the life and times of President Franklin Pierce, his presidency, and the rest of his life next time in part four. Uh, and a uh, very interesting fellow and uh, very, yeah, people don't, haven't, haven't given him enough credit, you know, for for the tough situation he was in, God bless Franklin Pierce. Uh, you might consider checking out our website, Adventures in History with Peter J. Ray at peterjray.com. So far, we've made 697 history videos in seven areas. World history, American history, book reviews, poetic tours, Cleveland baseball, family history, and autobiography. There's a donate feature. You might consider making a donation so we can continue, excuse me, making, those, making these videos. And uh, if you live in Metro Manila, Philippines, and are looking for a high school, you might Consider Russellist Educational Center. Russellist is located on located on Allenby Street, uh, the inclined plane physics concept, not far from the corner of P. Guevara and Wilson Street in San Juan, Metro Manila, Philippines. At Russellist, we specialize in helping young people who have had difficulty in the larger traditional high schools. We're more than a school; we are a warm, supportive community, and we strive to be creative and innovative so the students enjoy going to school and enjoy learning itself, develop a love of learning. And the, the website is restless.education, R-E-S-A-L-E-S-T. I hope you find a good history book to read. There's so many amazing, wonderful history books to read in whatever, uh, all of, from all over the world, different countries, and going way back in time. So hope you have a good one to read because there's just so many that are out there. God bless all the hi historians, authors of history books who just do tremendous work. And uh, that, I couldn't do any any things that I'm doing without without their without their focused effort on different the different topics which they research and write books on. Thanks so much for watching. Really appreciate it. God bless you. Take care. And I'll see you next time.